and then one on one. of the electric field. And they said that the direction of the electric field is going to be in the direction of an electric force that is exerted on a small positive test charge. So, let's say I have a big sphere and it's really positive. So this is my charged object. Okay. Well, this charged object produces an electric field around it that if another charged object comes into that field, it experiences a force. Does that make sense? So, let's say a tiny positive charge comes into the area surrounding, this is like a solid sphere. Does that make sense? So, it's not like the charged object didn't go into the sphere. Okay. Outside is my field force. If this little positive test charge comes into the electric field of that big charged object, you're going to have a field force. And the direction of the electric field, we said, is dependent upon the direction a positive test charge would appear. So, what is going to happen to the force on this? What direction is it going to head? this way. So the electric field has a direction to the right in this context. What if it were all negatives? Okay. So if we had a small positive test charge, the electric field direction would be to the left. Now, I do want to make one little caveat here. It's pretty important. Let's say that I have you know, just a, a traditional thing with some 
positives and negative charges on it. Okay? The reason why they say a small positive test charge is because if I have an object that has more than just a little bitty charge, okay, wouldn't this object, this charged object, cause the charges in here to move? Yes. Wouldn't that change the electric field of this? Yes. So just like we when we were doing these problems where we had ooh, we had point charges and we said what is the force on this one? What did we assume? They were fixed. That they were fixed and that this didn't affect this and this didn't affect this and all we were worried about was that these two affecting this. Right? Because technically, wouldn't these two affect each other? Causing them to repel, which would then also affect this force? Yes. yes. But figuring that out is extremely difficult. Okay? And that's a much higher level class if you want to figure that out. So what we're going to assume then is that we're going to use a small positive test charge, which doesn't affect the electrons in this guy changing its electric field. Okay? Because technically this would cause a lot of the electrons to go that way, correct? Which would change the electric field that it produces. So we're going to assume that when we're trying to feel, figure out the electric field strength, we're going to be using a small positive test charge which doesn't affect the electric field of the object we're studying. What would it do in that case then? Well, I, like, what would the numbers be? I don't know. But like, would it attract or in this case, all the electrons would start to shift this way, which would change the field. But what I'm saying is... Even if there's one? One. No, let's oh, see. if it's just a small positive yeah. test charge, we're going to say it's not going to affect the field force. And so we can just use our simple math problem, which I'm going to show you here in a little bit. Okay. But in reality, I do want you guys to understand that if you put two charged objects next to each other, and they're kind of relatively big charged objects, they're going to affect each other's electric field. It's going to be a lot more difficult than what we make it up to be. Okay. Even though we already think it's pretty difficult, don't we? Yeah. I mean, did you guys, we had a hard time doing, you know, the three-point charges, right? And that was assuming that these guys and these guys and these guys don't affect each other when we're studying just one. surrounding the charged object. Now, let's, did you get this in your note cards already? Good? All right, let's do a problem. What is the units for this? It was in the previous slide. I knew about the ones. Problem. 
particular guy. Okay? Then, it says find the field strength at a certain point. And that point is on the y-axis at point 4. So it's a positive point 4, so it'll be up, because we said this was the origin here, right? decided to say that when we're doing the electric field strength, we're going to use a positive test charge to figure out. Oh, is that a point four meters? Yeah, point four. Okay, so this is just the picture right now. Now remember, we're going to say that these two electric charges, pay attention to this, this is important. This is what I was kind of talking about earlier. These two electric charges do not cause each other to move, which in reality we know they do, right? This and this would be attracted so they would come towards each other. But we're saying they're fixed to make this problem easier. Which means we're just trying to figure out if I put a point charge, a small positive charge here, really what I'm trying to figure out is what the electric field strength is by having really both of these here. So really I have two fields overlapping. Is that the exact same thing? It's just with a different equation. Yep. Nice. Well, except for we're feeling we're, we're figuring out how strong the electric field is. What's the difference between that electric field? Between what? That electric and this. Yeah, they're very they're very similar ideas. I understand what you're saying, because when you talk about electric field, we're talking about how strong the electric field is, and when we're talking about electric force, we're saying how much force does that electric field produce. It's pretty close, yeah. It's the same equation. We're not using the same. Well, close. It's pretty much the same. Okay, now. When we talk about this equation, this is our equation, right? That Q is not the small positive test charge. That Q is the charge of your particular object that you're trying to figure the electric field of. So if I wanted to find the electric field strength of this charge, that's the Q I put in. If I want to find the electric field charge of this charge, that's the Q I put in. Yes. Oh, we're putting the Q. Yeah. What? 
we're, gonna, we're, we're trying to figure out how P is going to be affected by the fields of these two guys. So let's, we said this was Q1, right? I think this was Q2. Yes. We're trying to find, based on these two charges, both give off an electric field, we're trying to figure out how strong that field is at this point. Obviously, if I'm closer, the, 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 the field strength becomes stronger. As I get further away, it becomes weaker. Does that make sense? And where I place it, the electric field strength is going to be different. Does that make sense? Like, if I have two magnets and I have them close to each other, they're going to, you're going to feel more of an electric field strength closer than further away. Okay, so let's find E1 and E2. Okay. What charge am I putting in here for E1? Seven times 10 to the negative six. And what distance am I putting in? Point four. Point four. It's the same amount from both. No. We actually have to figure out what this distance is. But you guys can probably figure that out relatively quickly. Like point four and point four. This one's point three. Point four. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. When you do this, you should get a field strength of. <laughs> Now, 
These are the electric field directions. You can imagine if I took the two electric fields and I add them together, somewhere in between is where the electric field is going to be. Oh my word, we have to do that tip to tail wheel. Uh, uh, whenever you see arrows, you're like, <laughs> Guys, I have two electric fields that are, are here, right? One electric field is going to cause it to do that, another electric field is going to cause it to do that, so imagine taking and having tug of war in here. How, how do you do that, though, without a 90 degree angle? So how are you going to find an angle? Is that what you're asking? Don't get that look on your face. Turn your wife and all. Actually, I'd go to Mr. Merrifield to get an answer on this. Wife I don't know my geometry very well. What? What? Okay, we've got a minute, so. What? Shoot! Cramble. 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 Okay. Okay. Cramble. Cramble. Alright, so. There is a little law that Mr. Merrifield showed me called alternate interior angles are congruent. Yes. So. Yes. So. <laughs> So this is a 0 0.4, 0 0.3, okay? We can find this angle using inverse tangent. Opposite over hypotenuse. Adjacent, okay? When you do that, you find that this angle is 53.1. So when, it, when they say alternate interior angles are congruent, that means that this angle and this angle are the same. Yeah. <laughs> this is proof. This sounds like this so uh, That's what that angle is. Wait, which one? So we're saying, you see the relationship between this and this. We're saying this angle is 53.1, which I don't need that angle. I want that angle. And if this is 53.1, that has oh, to be 53.1. Okay, but where does it transfer to when you move it? <coughs> what? When you move it so they're tip to tail. It stays with it. It's the same angle. It's the same angle. So, so it was at the yeah. top of the arrow. So technically, this angle here is that 53.1. Because we're not changing its orientation at all. Oh, so it's not the angle that we want. 53.1 is the angle we want. So it's on top of it? The, the no, 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 look at this. This is this angle. I can make the rest as a box here. Oh. Can I see it? But, oh, yeah. But okay. Yeah. We want this angle so that we can resolve this vector, which is not on the x or y axis. Oh, yeah, okay. All right? That makes sense. Now, what we need to do then, we have E1 and E2. I want EX total and EY total. Well, our E1 is all what? E1. All on the one axis. Y. y. So all of E1 is on the Y axis. Is it positive or negative? Positive. Our E2 we have to break up into an X and a Y because it's not on the X or the Y only. Okay? So my opposite is my y. Did everybody see it? <laughs> opposite. And it's down, so it's going to be negative. So we need to plus, actually minus. Right. Guys, this is the exact same process as what we did for the forces, just with the electric field. Now we're taking E2 and breaking it up into an X and a Y. And we said this is the opposite, so it would be cosine of our angle that we said was 53.1. Not rushing. I'm so close. Our X is our adjacent, so we're still doing E2. Sign. Can we just use that whole number and 
This number here is that arrow, which we're breaking up into an X and a Y so we can add them. Why do that little I mean, I just, I'm, I'm not making them before. Why are you using 53, not the opposite of that? Then why do you minus that? Because you said that these angles are congruent. Don't you want the inside triangle though, not the other one? One this one? I mean, you can do it with this one, but then you, your opposite is now your x. Yeah, okay, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. I mean, that's not the angle we want in the answer. Uh, well, you can use this angle if you want. Yeah, yeah. But when we write at whatever, whatever degrees north, it doesn't matter. Wouldn't it be 3.1 minus 90? What? 90 minus 90. Okay, let me finish. When you, when you add those two together, you should get. 2.49 times 10 Now, last thing. I want to know the electric field total. What do you think we're going to have to do? Uh, no. No, find the uh, hypotenuse. Oh. Just like in what we did last week. I'm not rushing. Have I rushed? We're going past the time. I have not rushed. I never even did solve this today. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you